We have a book that, by Catherine Helm, who's the niece of uh, Mary Lincoln. And she was at the theater with the Lincolns and, uh, and watching Booth. Uh, and Booth, uh, was his Pescara he was in, I think, uh, and he had a, uh, a long speech on tyranny and against tyranny, and he came fairly close to Lincoln in the box. And Catherine goes over to Lincoln and says, that looks like it was aimed at you. And Lincoln says, that was fairly sharp. So tyranny certainly is one of the motives for Booth. What was the motive for Oswald? Ultimately, and we'll go back to you on that. Oswald's motive, I'm sure of it, is he wanted us to remember him. He wanted to be part of history. No evidence. Sounds suggest- like Lincoln. No evidence. Well, Booth had some political motives. He wanted revenge against how the South suffered in the war. His multiple targets suggested he wanted to perhaps change the outcome of the war or confound the Union. We can't find a political motive for Booth. Marguerite. Uh, his mother didn't give us one. Uh, Marina, his wife, didn't give us one. She said, I don't think he hated the president. We kept a John Kennedy magazine on our coffee table. He never. Oswald ranted and raved about many things to many people. He never ranted about JFK. He always wanted to be part of history. When he came back from the Soviet Union, and when he was there, he thought he'd be a star. They didn't care about him. They made him move to Minsk. He couldn't even live in Moscow. They made him a worker in a radio factory. thought that Richmond would take him in, you know, the South. And so Oswald came back. He began writing what he called my historic diary. He thought he was going to write a book. He had special insights. He thought his lifelong, he thought he was smarter than everybody. He had a chip on the shoulder. He thought that no one recognized his greatness. When he was arrested in New Orleans for handing out leaflets pro-Castro, he actually got on a couple radio shows and on a TV show. He, he was in his element. He thought, finally, I've been discovered. Finally, I am somebody. But then that fame faded. And uh, so here he is in November 63. His marriage is falling apart. He's got less than $200. That's his life savings. No Dead-end jobs. He's going nowhere. His wife's going to leave him. He has a month-old baby, a toddler girl. He has nothing left. It's a lifetime of failure and frustration. And then fate reaches out and tells him Mm -hmm. that the the most celebrated man in the world with his luminescence, his celebrity, his stardom, is coming to your town and he's driving right past your building. And you have the guy who will take you on the day that it's going to happen. That's the usual day to take him to the And he didn't didn't even have much of a plan. It, It was so quick. Oswald didn't have a driver's license. He didn't own a car couldn't drive a car. Just as he did after he tried to assassinate General Walker in April 63, Oswald tries to escape the murder of the President of the United States on a city bus. And then when that bus is going to take him right past the book depository again, uh, almost so he can see what he's wrought. It's so slow, he gets off and he takes a taxi. You've murdered the President of the United States and you're trying to escape on a bus and a taxi. That partly shows, I think, how little really thought and planning Oswald gave to this. I'm not sure he knew what he was going to do after he killed the president. It's funny that you mentioned radio and television because can you imagine John Wilkes Booth in today's era of radio and television? Mm-hmm. In, in fact, how many of the people involved in the story would be on talk shows, yes. would have their own reality shows? And Dan, I have to go back to, to the incident that you mentioned, and the more that I looked into that in the like previous Captain book, book. Uh, I, I'm convinced that was apocryphal hmm. because of the height difference and the the way in. There's, it's 11 foot six inches from mm-hmm. the ledge of the box. You're taking away a good story of mine now. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. I couldn't find enough basis in it to prove uh, the timing of it, uh, the shows of booths that Lincoln did see, and the fact that. Uh, he, w- he, he couldn't have come close to have his finger anywhere near the president, given the no, height No, but he certainly could project, and that's what you're saying his personality is. He doesn't have to be near him to, to Well, I, 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 I do agree with you, though, because if, Dan, even though you love the story, remember, I didn't include that story in Manhunt. Mm-hmm. Just as, as the dream, who was dead in the White House, mm-hmm. Lincoln finding himself in his own coffin in the White House, that, as you know, comes from Ward Hill Layman in the oh, 1880s. Yeah. And so... Even though that story is wonderful, I couldn't put it. I couldn't put it in Manhunt, and I agree with yeah. you that, that the story of Booth looking up at Lincoln and her saying, "He's directing this at you." 
I agree. I don't think it happened. I have an exegesis of that in one of the footnotes in the uh, Lincoln chapters in the Presidents in Theater book. Uh, this is uh, Hazelton, Joseph, Little uh, Joseph. Joseph Hazelton, who was 11 years old at the time, and became the, he was a program boy and the last survivor the as last well. Survivor. Of course, being 11, that helped him survive the longest. Uh, and of course, they were all numbers of them were brought in, and num numbers of them told stories before, during, after. What generally do you think was the? I'm sorry about this. This is coming apart here. Um, was the veracity of most of them, and did their stories change not only under interrogation <laughs> but just by their own volition? Withers, William Withers, the conductor, his story certainly changed every time he told the story. He never met an interviewer that he didn't like. It, it, the story, as Booth passed backstage, he the slashed slash, yeah. twice <laughs> uh, because Withers is standing in the corner with Jeannie Gourlay, who becomes his fiance within a couple of days and wife within a couple of weeks. Uh, every time Withers would tell that story, it was a, a stab to the heart. It was a stab to the neck. It almost killed him. He rushed heroically over to the gaslight controls to save Spangler wanting to turn the lights out. He single-handedly saved the, anything from happening worse. In fact, he has one quote that I love. He said later, uh, about 1915, he lived a while, he said it was largely on my testimony that the conspirators were convicted. So certainly his stories changed. Uh, there were others that never talked about it at all. John Diet, who was one of the major figures, wouldn't talk about it at all, wouldn't give interviews, never mentioned in his obituary. Hazelton got uh, fairly voluble as he got older, was giving little lecture tours about Lincoln. A lot of them waited until 1893 out of respect for Edwin Booth. And there's a whole flood of interviews at that point. Uh, they wait, the, the, the wait until Edwin Booth dies orthodoxy that held some of it back. But it's been beautiful now. The, the research that you can do with all these digital search engines were interviews that had been hidden before or military records and archives where you can digitally search through all of this are popping up information that had never surfaced before. And some of it were these later interviews. Uh, sometimes a flood. Jeannie Gourlay waits and gives all of hers to uh, Father Cormick and the archivist at Georgetown University. So it, in some cases it trickled out. In some cases they almost needed to get it off their chest before they died. But, but quite a bit of time elapses with some of the stories. And we have to be so careful when we look at them because some of them are great, but some of the people who gave accounts of witnessing the assassination that were published in the 1880s, 90s, or 1900 are wild. My favorite is of a crazy woman who, who said that Booth, she called him Wilkie. She said that Booth escaped the stage because someone threw a lasso over him, like a cowboy <laughs> lassoed Booth and pulled him off stage. Uh, well, there's your conspiracy theories, too. I talk about, about the Kennedy assassination. There, there, there were conspiracy theories. There are people who swore, Hazelton being one of them, to his dying day, Hazelton swore that Booth lived down in Enid, Oklahoma, and then finally died of arsenic poisoning. Yes. And yet, when they dig up Booth's body out of the, the arsenal floor, and they're, they're finally, three years later, burying it in, in Greenmount Cemetery in the family plot, they bring the body to an undertaker. They're passing it around. John Ford and all these others who knew him, members of Booth's family, the head is detached mm -hmm. from the body. They hold it up and they look at it and they say, you know, it really resembles him. I can see the expression. And his brother Joseph, the doctor, removes a plug tooth, remarks on that. Uh, they remark on the JWB tattoo that he had. How people can continue these conspiracy theories against all logical evidence yeah. is, is remarkable. Some of the evidence is so simple and plain. For example, you mentioned Withers and him being stabbed or cut. Withers claimed that blood was drawn. Well, Ford's theater displays his coat. There are no stab wounds. There are no slashes. And, and the same with Oswald. You know, the curtain rods. I'm taking curtain rods to the office. Well, what people forget is the thorough search of the building after the assassination, no curtain rods were ever found in the Texas School Book Depository. But a rifle was found. Uh, it, it can so often come down to the obvious physical artifact. It withers his application for disability pension from the Army. He had a complete physical done, and on that certificate, no visible scars. <laughs> Talking, you know, we have a passion for relics and mm -hmm. artifacts. Um, 
why aren't we going to be able to see? Why is the National Archives uh, holding on to things that for a hundred years we won't be able to see? I don't know, because as, as you know, the American people can see Abraham Lincoln's suit that he was wearing when he was shot. We can see the blood relics, we can see Booth Derringer pistol, his daggers, uh, we can see his revolvers, the Spencer repeating carbine he was carrying when he shot, we can see his keys, the photos of his girlfriends, you know, etc, etc, etc. In the case of the Kennedy assassination, all the major relics are held in secret and have never been shown to the public. Uh, Oswald's rifle, the president's suit, uh, Oswald's uh, pistol, Jackie's well, pink well, suit. Privately, and of course the, the ultra relic of all, Jacqueline Kennedy wouldn't change out of the pink suit. Yeah. That's why I put that on the cover of my book. So to show people that iconic image, she said, I'm not going to change clothes because I want them to see what they've done. Now, of course, she didn't mean the conspirators. What she meant was, I want the American people to see what my husband has suffered on their behalf. She wore it all day through the swearing-in photograph with LBJ. Five hours later, when Air Force One lands in Washington, millions of people are watching because this is the first look they're going to get at Jacqueline Kennedy since the assassination. The door of Air Force One opens, and there she stands, smeared with blood on her legs, her stockings, the, the oh, suit. Shocking. And she said again, I want them to see. Well, the archives has kept all these things secret, and uh, I don't think that's uh, proper. Um, I want to ask a question uh, first. Um, that I happen to have a letter here with an endorsement from Lincoln, April eighth of sixty four, and it's the date of the day he go the day he goes to uh, Edwin. Uh, he sees. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm forgetting who it was. Edwin Forrest, Edwin Forrest. as King Lear, and this is the the day he goes with this uh, endorsement. Um, Edwin Forrest, I want to ask you about the theater and the people who are in the 19th century theater at this time. Edwin Forrest said, uh, whenever a young man is incapable of learning a trade, is incompetent to be a store porter, is too lazy to beg and afraid to steal, he takes it to the stage as a proper field for the profitable exercise of his idiocy. Edwin Forrest did not suffer fools lightly. It's, it's remarkable that the stage manager at Ford's that night, John Wright, became a longtime stage manager in Forrest's tours because he's the only one who could put up with Forrest's temperament. Uh, Forrest, Forrest was a notoriously irascible. Uh, when he was on stage, he stood down center and you had to stand in the periphery. I don't care if you had a scene realistically <laughs> dialoguing with him, you let him have the downstage center spotlight, the, the literal limelight at that time. And, and yet Forrest used to change lines in his performances when Lincoln was president to reflect his antipathy toward Lincoln. He was not a fan of Lincoln's, as some of Forrest's letters to John Ford at the Library of Congress show. Is he, is, I'm sorry, I just want to, is he right about the people who populate the theaters? It, it, was, it, was, it was not, let's say, the, the most respected profession of the day. It was hardest on the poor actresses because an actress of that day was looked at as, as barely two steps above prostitution. Uh, the field of theater is nowhere near the respected field yeah, that it is today. today, unless you were a star. Uh, Laura Keene was respected, and remarkably in a man's world, uh, someone of Forrest's ilk would have been respected, but many of the others were, were looked down upon. You reminded me of one of my favorite lines ever from John Wilkes Booth. Uh, he was acting in Philadelphia when, in, I believe, 64, when he did that incredible run of Shakespearean performances, one great role after another. And he had many female fans, and they'd always write to him. And at one point, he got a very bold letter from a young teenage girl. And essentially, she's offering herself to Booth. And he decides, well, I have to meet the girl who can write a letter like this. So she's summoned, and he meets her, and he warns her that I find you very attractive, but I don't love you. Proceed at your peril. I'm a dangerous man. And, and she succumbs to Booth's charms, but before she does, he gives her this final warning. He says, remember, miss, actors are to be seen. They are never to be known. And I've mentioned that to a number of, of movie actors who I've happened to have met, and they've all said, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> 